Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. <laughs> so I've got a question for everyone before we kind of kick this off. My question is this, how many of you have ever been asked the question, by show of hands, what do you want to be when you grow up? Okay, pretty much everyone in the room. So this is a question that I've been asked a hundred times as I was younger. And this question kind of always bothered me for a few reasons. The first reason why it bothered me was because when people said, what do you want to be when you grow up? My first question was always, what is grown up? Does grown up mean 18? Does it mean 21? Does it mean 30? Does it mean 50? Does it mean 100? What is grown up? And then the second reason why this question always bothered me was because the word be seems so final, as if I can only really be one thing. What do you want to be when you grow up? And for me, for someone who had a lot of different interests, that was always a big kind of question in my mind, which is, okay, what, what do I want to be? Is there really only one thing that I can be? Now, I was probably fairly lucky because I grew up in Arizona, which is a state in the United States right next to California, to two parents who both met in the accounting department at IBM where they were working. And they were fortunate enough working for IBM to get a discount on computers. So when I was seven years old, they brought home this device. And they put this in one of the rooms in our house and they said, Stacy, you and your brother, who's two years older, his name is Scott, you two can play on this device for 30 minutes every day, that's it, educational games on this device. But I felt really, really fortunate to have this opportunity to play on this device, and the older I got, the more fascinated I became with all the things that you could do with this computer. I started off playing educational games, but as time went on and I got a little bit older, my parents said, all right, you can start kind of browsing the internet and seeing what else is out there. And eventually I realized there are websites and people have created this stuff. And one of the natural questions that I had was, great, how do I create my own? And so as I was going on Google and searching and realizing, all right, if I want to go and create something, I'm gonna have to learn how to code. So I went to my brother and the two of us growing up were always really good friends and, and I said, hey, do you wanna learn how to code? Should we learn how to code and build something our own so that we can build something that is then on this computer that other people can go and look at? My brother said, yeah, that sounds good, let's, let's do that. So throughout middle school and high school, my brother and I started using our 30 minutes every day at the computer to learn how to code. And eventually one day after I graduated from high school, the day after I graduated from high school, my parents said, Stacy, it's, it's time for you to go and get an internship. You have to start working at a, a company and build your resume so that you can get a good job. And I went back to my parents and said, well, Scott and I have been learning how to code Rather than getting an internship, I think I'd like to go and start a business with him. We've got this great idea. We want to allow people to be able to store all of their usernames and passwords online so that they'd never have to click that forgot password button again. And we want to go and build this for the summer in between high school and college. Now, my dad, being the man that he is, comes back and says, well, if you want to start a business, then you need to learn the value of a dollar so you need to move out of the house and learn how to be financially independent. So me being the kind of young 18 year old at the time, but very optimistic, I went back and I looked at my bank account that I had, saving up from birthdays and holidays, a little bit of money that I had gotten every year up to my 18 years. And my brother and I did some quick math. We realized, all right, if we move out of the house, we could rent an apartment, and my brother had found an apartment in Los Angeles because California was the place that we thought we needed to be for technology, and he was like, we can rent this apartment in LA for 900 bucks a month, 900 US dollars. It's two bedroom, if we split one of the bedrooms and try and rent that bedroom out to someone else, it's 450 a month, and if we split that two ways, it's 225 a month, 
and we only have two and a half months in between high school and college, so let's do it. So my brother and I went back to my dad and we said, we are going to go ahead and take the money that we've saved, move to Los Angeles, and start this business. And that was really one of the first times in my life that I learned one of the most important lessons, which was how important it really is to get outside of my own comfort zone. And so after packing up our bags, my brother and I moved to Los Angeles and we got into the apartment that we had rented and every day we sat down and started coding and building our first website for this username and password storage company that we wanted to start. And as we were building the first version of that website, one day I, in the morning, was checking Twitter just as I was eating my cereal, getting ready to, to work for the day. And a tweet came across my feed and I clicked on it, and the tweet was just out into the universe to anyone, and the tweet said, enjoy intimate cocktails plus two parties with me in Miami on June 15th, 16th, $2,000 to charity. And the tweet was from Richard Branson. Now, how many people by show of hands know who Richard Branson is? Okay, most of you. So he started Virgin Group. And I saw this tweet knowing that Richard was one of the best known entrepreneurs of our time. And as you can probably see, the next tweet after that was an email address. And so I immediately took that email address, popped it into my email, and I emailed and said, hi, my name is Stacy Ferreira. I am 18 years old, so I am not legally old enough to drink cocktails with you in the United States. But I would absolutely love to come with my brother to Miami and meet you so that I can learn how you grew your businesses. I got an email back later that night from his secretary, and she said, great, if you can donate $4,000 and be in Miami in 48 hours, then you can meet with him. Now keep in mind, at the time, my brother and I are sitting there looking at ourselves, first kind of astounded that we even got an email response, but then second, thinking, okay, we're two broke college kids, whose parents said we have to move out of the house and learn how to be financially independent. We don't have $4,000. How are we going to do this? So I did the only thing that I could think of to do at the time, which was call dad. <laughs> and I said, hey, dad. Now, this is 2011, so I said, I know that you don't know what Twitter is, but there's this amazing opportunity to go meet Richard Branson in Miami for cocktails. I wanna learn from him about how he grew his business. And now at this point in the story, you all know my dad a little bit, so you, you can probably anticipate what he said next. He came back on the phone and he said, Stacy, write up a proposal for me. Why do you need this money? Where is the money going? And most importantly, you need to attach a spreadsheet so that I can see what your payment plan is to pay me back over time. <laughs> so I'm looking at the watch. I'm thinking, we've got 48 hours, this is the countdown, and I've got to fly all the way to the other side of the country. But I sit down and I start typing away this proposal, finish it up, send it off to my dad. My dad gives me a call back and he says, Stacy, Here's the deal. You have two options. Option number one is I will loan you the money with the one stipulation that by the time that you step foot on college campus, in three months, you have to pay me back all $4,000. Or option number two is you don't take the loan. It's a lesson in money management. Think about it and give me a call back. So I sat there and thought about it a little bit. And realistically, about 10 minutes later, I picked up the phone and I called him back and I said, all right, dad, I'll take the loan. Took the loan and flew to Miami. And learned the second big lesson in my life, which is keep an open mind. There are opportunities all around you. And in Miami, when I was there with my brother, the two nights that we were there, it was a small, intimate room of people who had responded to Richard's tweet. 
And one of the things that really amazed me about it was that even though that tweet was out there to anyone, and they had 25 opportunities for people to come to the event, only 18 people took advantage of that opportunity. Granted, it's a lot of money to donate. You have to fly to Miami from wherever you are in the world. But for me, I saw it as an opportunity to learn from someone who had done something incredible who I wanted to be like. And so those two nights, we got to meet with Branson and ask him questions about how he grew his business. And he asked questions back, asking us, you know, what is the business that you two are starting? What compelled you to fly from California over here and donate money to a charity just to meet me? And we answered all of these questions. And after the event, my brother and I went up to Branson and we said, hey, could we have your email address so that we can continue to stay in contact with you and ask you questions over time? Because two nights at an event is fantastic, but it's better if you can build that relationship. And so we handed him a piece of paper and he wrote down his email address and handed it to us. And I'll never forget, my brother took that piece of paper immediately and ran over to his secretary and was like, is this really his email address? <laughs> And she was like, yeah, it is, so keep it close. And so we flew back to California, more motivated, more eager than ever before to really buckle down and get this business off the ground. And so we built the first prototype of it, launched the product, got a bunch of users on to start, and then we went and had three specific questions around really how we wanted to scale this product out to more people. And we sent those three questions over to Branson in an email. And we said, hey, these are some questions, some things that we're encountering in our business. Would you mind chatting with us a little bit or responding in an email, um, giving us some answers and some clues as to how you've done this or other companies that you've been around have, have kind of tackled these challenges? And he sent back an email and he said, I'm gonna introduce you to a few other friends who can help answer these questions for you. So he introduced us to a few folks one of which was a guy named Jerry Murdoch, who started Insight Venture Partners, which is a venture capital firm that invests money in new companies. And just a few days later, after Branson made the intro to Jerry, Jerry actually got on a plane, and he flew out to California from where he lives in Colorado, and he met us at the office that we had at the time, which doubled as an office and our home where we were sleeping. And he sat down with us and helped answer a few of these questions. And he came back at the end of the day and he said, I wanna take you guys out to dinner tonight. So my brother and I went to dinner with Jerry. And at that dinner, Jerry said, I've got a deal for you. I spoke to Branson, I spoke to my other friend, Alex Welch, and the three of us would love to invest 1.2 million US dollars to help you guys grow your business. Like everything else, he said, I'll give you some time to think about it. My brother and I thought about it and we accepted the money <laughs> and started growing the business. And if you're wondering, yes, the first thing that we did with that was pay my dad back. <laughs> and over the course of the next few years, we were, my brother and I and a few other people that we hired started to grow and build the business. And there was this repeating cycle that we found in growing this business that was vital to our success. And it was this, try, fail, learn, repeat. And over the course of the next few years in building the business, this was the motto that we lived by. And one day, a few days later, we had a few companies come to us and say, you know, we're interested in striking a deal with you. We'd like to purchase the technology that you've built and integrate it into our company. And in 2013, my brother and I accepted yet another deal to sell our company to reputation.com in the Bay Area. So my brother and I packed up our bags and moved to the Bay Area. And in moving to the Bay Area, people kept asking me this question again, which was, Stacy, okay, now you're 20 years old 
and you've sold a business, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this was a question that I kind of struggled with myself now at this point, which was, what's next? I'm sure many of you have felt like this in your own careers. What's next? What else do I want to do? And so I went on a journey while I was working at the company that acquired us to try and figure out for myself what really I wanted to do. And on the side, as a side project while working at reputation.com, I teamed up with a friend of mine, Jared Kleiner, to publish a book called Two Billion Under 20. And this book, what I wanted to explore with this was talk to other young folks in my generation who were 20 years old and younger and ask them, what is it that you want to do throughout the course of your career and how are you gonna make those choices? And what are the things that you're working on today that you think will be stepping stones to getting there? And so in publishing this book, I was able to talk to hundreds of young kids across the globe to kind of understand what the answers to these questions were for them. And one thing that was really, really interesting to me was that all of these young people that I was talking to at 20 years old had told me about multiple things that they had already explored throughout their younger years. People who had said, you know, I was really interested in YouTube, so at one point I created a YouTube channel, and then I started learning how to code, and so I started building my own websites. And I became really fascinated with how this younger generation switched jobs. And so I went back and I started talking to people very, very close to me and asked them similar questions of, hey, how did you choose to do what it is you chose to do over the course of your career when you were trying to figure out what that next step was for you? And the first person that I talked to was actually my grandma. And I asked her and I said, Grandma, how did you choose what it is that you decided that you wanted to do throughout your career? And she came back to me and said, Stacy, there was really one way that I chose, which was I had to pay the bills to be able to provide for your dad and his two other brothers. And she was like, to do this, I worked one job my entire career. I worked 42 years in a factory, and I knew that that was gonna be the thing that paid the bills steadily. And then I went and I talked to my mom. And I asked, mom, how did you choose what it is that you chose to do over the course of, of your career? And my mom said, well, you know, it started off that I wanted to do something that would be steady to pay the bills to raise you and your brother. And I worked two jobs. And then once you got, um, once you were born, Stacy, I took some time off to raise you and your brother while your dad worked and then went back into the workforce. And this time going back into the workforce, decided that I wanted to do something that I was more interested in, that I was really passionate about. And then I started talking to kids in my generation and their careers were looking like this by the time they were 30 years old. And I said, you know, how is it that you're choosing to do what it is you wanna do? And a lot of people came back to me and said, Stacy, I wanna do things that pay the bills, but things that I'm really passionate about, and I don't care if I have to do three or four things of, the, of those at the same time, but I kinda wanna do them all. I'm interested in a lot of different things. And I became really, really fascinated with this notion and I realized that the way that we are working is changing. This young generation, more than anything, is interested in how they can make an impact and the things that they're passionate in when they're looking for making that next career move. And a lot of times, I found that people were working in the gig economy, working for Uber or Lyft or Amazon Flex or DoorDash or all of these on-demand economy companies to be able to fuel making enough money to be able to work on their passions. And this was something that I became really, really fascinated in, which was this changing nature of work. One of the stats that I read as I was thinking about the nature of work was that in the United States, 58% of the American population works an hourly job. And when I started talking to a lot of friends of mine who worked in retail, restaurants, hotels, they started telling me, Stacy, I would absolutely love the same sort of flexibility to be able to pick and choose my hours that folks driving for Uber or DoorDash or Lyft have. And so this was an idea that I started playing around with, which was could we give flexibility to this workforce to be able to empower folks working hourly to pick and choose their own hours? 
And one day, a friend approached me, and she said, Stacy, you know, you've had a lot of ideas around the future of work. Um, I want you to come and speak at an event that I'm hosting in Los Angeles and kind of share some of your ideas around what you think the future of work looks like based off of all the thinking and research that you've done. And so again, kind of keeping with one of the mottos that I had, which was keep an open mind and, and take advantage of opportunities that are in front of you, I said, yes, sure, I'd love to come speak at your event. Little did I know that there would be a few other folks at that event. <laughs> So I was, I was fortunate enough to sit on a panel with um, a girl named Tallulah Riley, who's actually just to the left here of Elon. And Tallulah Riley was married to Elon Musk um, for about eight years. And Tallulah and I, through speaking on this panel, started going back and forth on the ideas around future of work. And we started talking and kind of discussing, first on this panel, and then at brunch, um, and then over email, a long email thread that we had about what the future of work would look like. And as I was kind of thinking about what that future of work looks like, I also got a call from the Teal Foundation, which you'll hear a little bit more about from Daniel Strockman, who will be up here in a little bit. And they gave me a call and said, Stacy, we've got this fellowship, and if you want to be a part of it, the way that you can is we'll give you $100,000. Don't go back to college. So I was thinking about going back to college after selling the first business, and go work on this idea for the future of work. And now, I'd already dropped out of college once to start the first business, so I wasn't sure how my parents would react to this, <laughs> not going to college and then um, not completing it. But I took advantage, again, of that Teal Fellowship, and I said, sure. I won't go back to college, and I'll ideate around this future of work idea. And now when I told Tallulah that I was going to take the Teal Fellowship, take the $100,000 to work on this idea, obviously Elon and Peter were friends through PayPal, and so Tallulah said, you should totally do that and move to LA and let's work on this idea together. And so in 2016, Tallulah and I partnered up for the next venture that I started called Forge. And with Forge, what we're doing is building a platform that enables people to pick and choose the hours that they're working across multiple jobs so that they can make enough money, but also hopefully fund those passions or those side gigs. So the thing that I want to kind of leave everyone with here today is this. Throughout the course of my career, there have been a lot of twists and turns. And I'm still young and still figuring it out, as a lot of my peers are. But one of the biggest things that I've learned about myself and about this generation is that there is truly not one thing to be when you grow up. In fact, it is an exploration of all the things that you want to be a part of, make an impact on, and put your name and your stamp of approval on during your time here on this planet. So the challenge that I have for all of you here is this. The next time you're asking yourself, what should I do next? Or the next time that you're asking younger folks, maybe a niece, a nephew, a brother, or a sister, what they're interested in, don't ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead, ask them, what are all the things that you want to explore throughout your career? And today, I hope that the rest of the day piques your mind and gives you a lot more things to be excited about exploring. Thank you.